welcome to to everyone and especially uh, especially Professor Nikolai Slavov. We're all uh, looking forward to hear your talk. So let me first uh, briefly introduce you to the audience. So uh, Professor Slavov joins us um, from Boston, from the Northeast, uh, Northeastern University, where he is now an associate professor at the Department of Bioengineering, uh, I think since this year. And his academic career is quite impressive. So he joined all the uh, good universities in the US. So he started his bachelor at MIT, then joined Princeton for his master's and his PhD, then went back to MIT again uh, for his first postdoc. And then for his second postdoc, he went to Harvard. And then after that, he joined Northeastern where he first became an assistant professor. And now he's an associate professor. And what I personally find quite impressive is that he uh, last year was announced to be one of the Ellen Distinguished Investigators uh, for people who do research that have the potential to reinvent their entire field. So his field is uh, single cell proteomics. Um, and I guess that he would talk about that today. Of course, he has uh, won many awards, um, but I think we can continue now. So please share your screen and we're all looking forward to uh, hearing and seeing you. Thank you very much for the generous introduction and for inviting me. I'm delighted to be part of the Max Quan Summer School because I deeply appreciate its mission to train uh, colleagues in the field of uh, computational analysis of mass spectrometry data, proteomics, metabolomics. I think that's very needed and I feel very, very passionate for the utility of, of your mission and what the summer school is doing. I'll also take um, advantage of being able to, to speak to such a large audience today, not only to summarize what we and others have been able to accomplish in the field of single cell proteomics, but to highlight opportunities for students uh, who can contribute new creative ideas. I think that there are tremendous, tremendous opportunities ahead of us that um, are in need of bright creative ideas. And I think many of the students in the audience might have the next best idea how to solve the challenges that we had ahead of us. So I'd like to start with a short motivation. Why do single cell proteomics? One answer might be because it's hot. And for me personally, that has never been a good justification. Uh, what the justification is, is that uh, the, the tissues that make up our bodies are tremendously heterogeneous, as you can appreciate here in this picture of a tumor cell with uh, several T lymphocytes attached to the, to the tumor cell. If we are to take a tumor sample and, and grind it up and analyze it, we are going to measure proteins that come from infil infiltrating blood cells, from the stroma, from tumor cells, from normal cells, from a variety of different cell types. And from that mixed population, it is difficult to disentangle which proteins come from which cells. So one simple motivation is just to be able to uh, distinguish and analyze the heterogeneity of cells making up um, tissues in, in our bodies and animal bodies. Similarly, even in, in experiments that we conduct in the lab, if we differentiate stem cells, we usually generate highly heterogeneous mixtures of different cell states and cell types. And being able to analyze that heterogeneity is oftentimes very useful, as single cell RNA sequencing has indeed beautifully demonstrated over the last decade or so. And single cell RNA analysis continues to be increasingly important, uh, very important, but uh, it's not sufficient to characterize all biological functions. And here on the left, I show one anecdotal piece of data uh, for the correspondence between the protein level of P53, the tumor suppressor protein, and the messenger RNA from which it's translated. Uh, these data derive from a cohort of patients and the relatively poor correlation between RNA and protein should always make you consider the possibility that this is due to measurement noise. But in this case, we know that the measurement error is relatively small. Rather, what's happening with this very well-studied protein is that the messenger RNA is expressed mostly constitutively 
and the abundance of the protein is regulated primarily by degradation. And if we move away from that one example and look more generally at protein levels across human tissues that were measured as part of the human draft map um, atlas, we find that RNA levels are better at predicting the overall abundance of a protein, whether it's going to be highly or lowly abundant, but the ability to predict the relative levels of a particular protein is shown here across different human tissues is much more limited. And we did uh, detailed analysis of this dependence accounting for experimental error, uh, measurement error, which is always essential uh, when we want to make conclusions about the relationship between RNA and protein levels. Uh, but the abundance of proteins is just the tip of the iceberg. What we really want to know is uh, also how proteins interact with each other, how they're being modified as part of um, cellular signaling processes, how they move from one part of the cell to another. And I thought that yesterday Rudy Abersold gave several compelling examples of how mass spectrometry can go beyond just the measured protein abundances and move closer to identifying uh, these functional uh, interactions between proteins as, as they give rise to the various phenotypes. And while much of what has happened so far in the field of single cell proteomics has been to measure protein abundances, and that will be mostly what they talk about today, all of the ideas that, I, that we discuss here today are laying the foundations for doing uh, functional analysis of proteins, their interactions in cells, modifications, and so on. So the aspiration is always to leverage all of the capabilities of mass spectrometry to go beyond just quantifying protein abundances to measuring these other aspects of, of the proteome. Uh, another very exciting application for me of doing single cell protein measurements is the ability to take advantage of these data of having many thousands of cells in which we have quantified the proteins to infer regulatory interactions uh, that in, in the cell. And this can be done by thinking of each cell as corresponding to a particular perturbation. And then one might be able to do data-driven inferences with minimum assum uh, minimal assumptions, as I'm going to briefly touch upon towards the end of my presentation today. So in terms of doing single cell proteomics, if you're interested in doing it today, there are well-established protocols that you can start using right now. So here I'm, I'm showing one protocol from uh, our group, uh, but it's certainly not the only one. Other groups have used uh, methods, sometimes very, very similar methods, even if the name is different, uh, or label-free approaches to, to single cell proteomics. Um, but you can, you can start doing it today. There is nothing specialized or inaccessible in what is required to perform single cell proteomics using the methods that, that we have developed. In fact, we have used relatively old mass spec instruments. We have used QExactive basics and we have used only commercially available equipment. So you can follow the detailed description in, in this protocol if you wanted to start analyzing cells today and you can already use the capabilities of, of current technologies to answer biological questions. You can analyze hundreds of cells in, in a single day, and you can quantify thousands of proteins. So of course we want to do more, and I'm going to spend most of the rest of my presentation today of outlining opportunities to in, increase the, 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 the capabilities of, of our methodology. But what is important to emphasize, and I want to underscore here, is that even today with the capabilities that we already have with our established protocols, you can start using them to, to answer biological questions, and they think we should all do that. So from the very beginning, one observation that um, I always found very inspiring was the fact that proteins are so much more abundant than messenger RNAs in, um, in cells. On average, for each messenger RNA present in a cell, there are about a thousand protein copies. And this observation is very important if we not only want to detect molecules in single cells, but if we want to quantify them. 
Why is that? Because generally methods don't detect every single molecule present in the sample, rather they sample, they take a subset of those molecules, a process well modeled by the Poisson distribution here shown on the right. And the low copy number of messenger RNAs per cell means that even relatively good capture efficiency, such as 20%, results in very large counting errors of estimating the abundance of RNAs. And those errors exist even if everything else is absolutely perfect from sample preparation to sequencing to data analysis. If that's perfect, you would still have this counting error left. And we speculated uh, in uh, a few years ago that one should be able to do better, at least in terms of counting errors with mass spectrometry, even if we have lower sampling efficiency, because we start with such a large pool of molecules to begin with compared to RNA sequencing. And we were able to demonstrate this expectation uh, based on um, methods that, that we had developed. So here on the left, I'm showing a piece of data demonstrating that. If we use 10x genomics, which is one of the most widely used commercial methods for single cell RNA sequencing, we, uh, we detect hundreds of copies for some messenger RNAs, but they're the minority of analyzed messenger RNAs. For most of them, we detect only a couple of copies. And this is associated with a large error, a counting error in estimating their abundance. While in the case of mass spectrometry, we are able to uh, detect about 20 fold more copies for the same genes per gene. And this is associated with smaller counting error and these smaller counting errors are also uh, reflected in having relatively good relative protein quantification. What is shown here on the right are relative protein levels measured between macrophages and monocytes, either in bulk on, on, on the x-axis or in single cells using scope to a method that my group has developed. So, I want to start with a big picture of what are some of the challenges and some of the solutions that have been provided so far. We are needed more solutions to be sure, but uh, some of the challenges are how do we deliver proteins from single cells efficiently to mass spec instruments. Mass spec detectors are quite sensitive, but delivering the proteins of a single cell to the detector so that they can be quantified is not trivial. So delivering uh, improving delivery has evolved, has involved many creative experimental designs for sample preparation, high performance separation, improved ionization, and, and so on. Then once we deliver ions to the instrument and we detect them, it's very useful to identify their sequence if we want to use them for biological inferences. And that, in fact, is going to be a focus of the next section of my talk. Uh, another aspect of single cell analysis is the need to analyze very large number of single cells uh, because analyzing a couple of cells in, is usually not sufficient to answer biological questions. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but in general, for many applications, we, we want to have many thousands of single cells analyzed. And there are a number of solutions that the community has provided to these challenges that they summarized in, in this review article here referenced at the bottom. Uh, some of the solutions have been driven by the vendors of instruments, by Brooker, by Thermo Fisher Scientific, and they have been or various manufacturers of uh, uh, chromatographic columns, nano LC, and so on. And, and these I've summarized under one as improvements in nano LC and, and instrumentation. Then another set of solutions have come in the form of creative experimental designs, clever ways that uh, students and, and, and their advisors have come up with designing an experiment to increase the sensitivity or the throughput, even by using the same hardware that, that already exists. And some improvements have come from enhanced data interpretation, which is particularly relevant to a summer school focused on computational methods. And I think that there is a lot more advance, uh, a lot more advances to be made on the side of improving data interpretation. So just to remind you, this being a summer school, how peptides look to the, to the mass spec instrument. 
Well, uh, this is a figure taken from, from a review by, by Pavel and, and Jorgen. Uh, so each line here corresponds to, a, to an individual survey scan. And of course, peptides uh, contain um, a different number of heavy isotopes, which results in seeing those isotopic envelopes that allow us also to determine the charge of each peptide um, or each ion that is present uh, for which we see these uh, isotopic envelopes uh, and to also quantify the, the abundance. So one aspect for a single cell proteomics that is very encouraging, again, I like to emphasize what, what is encouraging, what, what, the, uh, what, what the potentials are, is that when we analyze a single mammalian cell, such as a HeLa cell, just one cell into the instrument, we can detect tens of thousands of peptide-like features. In this case, 60,000 features detected from a single HeLa cell. So what are these features? First, they're not a blip on the detector because to identify a feature, we need to see the isotopic envelope and we need to see it across multiple survey scans. Why do, we, why do I say they're peptide-like features? Because they have charge larger than one. Now, these features are certainly not all identifiable peptides. Some of these are modified uh, peptides that so would never identify. Uh, some of them may not even be peptides, but based on what we know from uh, bulk mass spectrometry, we, we, uh, we can think that a good fraction, maybe 20, 30 or more uh, percent of those 60,000 features are in principle identifiable peptides. And I think that poses a really exciting challenge to be able to identify their sequences because sequences are the links to biology. Ions are difficult to interpret. Ions are going to change depending on the ingestion efficiency, fluctuation of instruments and all sorts of issues. So they're not as useful for downstream biological interpretations. But if we can get to identify even 20% of these 60,000 features, I think we'll be in a really good shape. So how can we do that? Uh, and, and again, this also shows that we don't lack raw sensitivity. It's not that mass spec detectors are not sensitive. We can detect those features, MaxQuant can identify them. These features are identified by MaxQuant. It's just a question of being able to go beyond that, identify their sequences. And here you can also see the example that despite having seen so many features, relatively few of those have been analyzed by MS2 scans and even fewer, very small fraction are being identified in terms of sequences. And this contrasts with a larger sample of hundred cells where we can identify substantially more peptides. So there have been several approaches for enhancing uh, sequence identification that I'm going to summarize uh, here briefly. Some of those have been on the side of uh, experimental design and data acquisition, and some of them have been purely on the side of data interpretation. Uh, certainly, we have not run out of ideas. In my lab, we pursue ideas uh, to further enhance data interpretation, and I think that there are many other opportunities that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, so one experimental design that we introduced is to use isobaric carriers that many of you might be familiar with, but I'll briefly summarize. Uh, we label um, peptides from small samples, such as single cells, with isobaric mass tags. And we also label peptides from a larger number of, of cells with isobaric mass tags, which we call isobaric carrier. Then we mix them together and we analyze them with standard nano-LC tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, and of course, the uh, isobaric carrier can increase the intensity of the precursors and make it easier to detect them. But what I just showed you previously is that precursor detection is not a limitation, even for a single cell. We can see plenty of precursors. So that's not the main benefit. The main benefit is that when we isolate the precursors and fragment them, we can both uh, identify, we can both quantify their relative abundance in the single cells based on the uh, reporter ions. And we can use peptide fragments derived from the single cells and from the carrier to enhance our ability to, to identify the sequence. 
And if one uses this approach, one might obtain very good quantification as demonstrated here with quantifying relative protein abundances between two cell types. So the relative protein abundances in single cell lysates agree very well with the expectation for more standard bulk measurements. But of course, that's not always the case. If one is, doesn't understand the approach and uses suboptimal instrument parameters or doesn't design the experiment well, one can also see a substantial decline in this correlation as shown here in the blue curve for experiment that we benchmarked the, 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 uh, the trade-offs of increasing the speed of data acquisition with sampling fewer copies from, from the small samples. And therefore, while this experiment provides a potential for accurate quantification, it doesn't guarantee it. So potential for accuracy doesn't mean accuracy. And one thing that I would like to encourage all of you who are interested in using this experimental design is to include as many positive and negative controls as you can so that you can benchmark for yourself how well you're succeeding in utilizing the potential for accuracy. And in this paper uh, published recently, we outlined in detail how you might be able to take advantage of, of using this method for either higher throughput or higher accuracy of quantification and what the trade-offs involved are. Now, I want to move to another um, example of data acquisition that can enhance sequence identification. And this is uh, a project that uh, we developed in collaboration with the COGS group and in particular with Christoph Wichmann. Uh, he helped uh, with uh, optimizing MaxQuantLife for some of our applications. And of course, you already heard about MaxQuantLife, but let me tell you here what the application that we've used it for is. So, Normally, as I already said, even in a single cell, we detect lots of precursors. That's not a problem. We have the sensitivity to see the precursors. But some of those precursors might come from trypsin or from various other non sequence pep modified peptides that we'll never identify. So if we don't spend mass spec time on those precursors, we can spend time on the precursors that we can productively sequence and therefore increase our coverage. That's one application. Another advantage is that instead of identifying just the most abundant peptides, as would be the case with a shotgun approach, we can prioritize here in blue precursors corresponding to peptides of interest that are more important for the biological process that we study. And as another benefit, we can um, uh, improve our ability to sample peptides close to the illusion peak apex compared to the shotgun approach. And because we know that we are not just sampling any random ion that happened to be abundant, but we are sampling an ion that is important for the biological process that we study, we can increase the accumulation times and therefore in increase our sensitivity. So how does this work? I'll show you just a couple of snippets of data uh, at this point, so comparing shotgun analysis and prioritized analysis of the same samples. So here is the results for quantified values are shown in red and missing data in white. So we, we can have different tiers of priority. Here on the left are the most important peptides in this particular experiment to which we gave high priority. And you can see that the prioritized data acquisition has substantially less missing values than the shotgun data acquisition. And this is also true for the medium priority and even for the low priority. So we are able to uh, analyze um, peptides and assign our limited resources to them based on their relative importance for, for our biological question. Uh, and here's another statistical summary of the results. As I mentioned, we can increase the depth of coverage because we don't spend time on non-productive MS2 scans. And you can see that uh, the prioritized analysis identifies more PSMs at any level of confidence, high level of confidence compared to the shotgun analysis. Uh, and the success of identification is very high for our highest priorities and actually remains higher than shotgun for any priority level. So this is just a teaser of, of an application that we've developed and uh, Gray Huffman is going to tell you more about that at the single cell proteomics conference month and a half from now. <laughs> 
Now, another approach to enhance sequence identification is, of course, match between runs, for which being part of the school, I, I believe you, you've already heard and you understand how it works. And the idea is that once you have identified the features corresponding to peptides, if you have a feature that is sequenced in one experiment, you can transfer that sequence from the experiment to another experiment by aligning the retention time and uh, M over Z measure. Another, another approach in, in similar vein to enhance uh, sequence identification to propagate sequences is to use a Bayesian framework for transfer for updating the confidence in peptide spectral matches in PSMs based on information such as the retention time or ion mobility. So one can uh, decrease the confidence in incorrect PSMs and increase confidence in correct PSMs. And the advantage of this approach is that uh, you can use a principled statistical approach to estimate uh, the, the confidence in, in each PSM. So as a whole, and these are not the only methods. So there are a number of other methods for propagating sequence across uh, different runs. Um, sometimes they're, oftentimes they're called matching between runs. And here I've summarized a few categories of those. So the one approach which gives you the highest sensitivity and the lowest confidence is when you cannot even identify a feature. There is no identified feature, but you can still go and extract ion current. And an example of that is ICER, an, an, uh, an approach recently developed in the lab of uh, Euron Crixwell. Another approach in the middle is to, uh, to only match when you can identify a feature, which again, I remind you, that's a nice topic cluster. That's not just a blip on the detector. So that gives you higher confidence. And the approach where you require to have an MS2 uh, spectrum so that you use both MS1 and MS2 information uh, can give you even higher confidence. But of course, not every ion is going to have, every precursor is going to have an MS2 spectrum. So uh, this approach gives you the lowest sensitivity as well. Uh, you can update the confidence for the uh, lowest number of ions. So I told you about some of the things that so far have been done by the community in the field, but I think we are just scratching the surface. I think that there is space for a lot of bright ideas. And I'm hoping that many of the students in the audience are going to feel inspired by the large number of precursors identified in single cells and think of ways of how we can improve our data interpretation. So with that, I'm going to shift a little bit more to uh, what we have done so far in terms of biological applications and what I think are some exciting frontiers on that front. Now, the simplest thing that single cell data is used for, and it's actually by far the, the biggest use at the moment, certainly for RNA sequencing data, is just to identify clusters of cells. And in this case, I'm showing one example from my group where uh, just by doing principal component analysis of single cell proteomics data, we're able to identify clusters of cells. Each cell here corresponds to a circle uh, corresponding to either monocytes or macrophages. And uh, these clusters can be identified based on marker genes. So in this case, here on the left, the cells are based on having known the identity of each cell when we did the sorting. But even if we don't know it, we can still identify the cells based on the genes that they express. Now, a more exciting uh, extension of this approach is when we not only identify the cell types and the proteins that are more abundant, which can be used as validation, and what I'm showing here in panels A and B is really validation that the proteins that are more abundant in these cell types are indeed consistent with their functions, such as proliferation related proteins being more abundant in monocytes, makes sense because they're, they're proliferative cells, and adherent proteins being more abundant in macrophages, immune proteins being more abundant in macrophages makes sense as they're more specialized to adhere and perform Im immune functions. But the thing that was more exciting uh, for us is the discovery of this unexpected gradient of heterogeneity within the macrophage-like cells uh, that we did not know for a priori. Nobody had seen that of, mono of monocytes differentiating to macrophages in a uniform experimental system without polarizing cytokine and nonetheless observing 
a gradient of polarization. And because we had measured many proteins, we were able to identify what functionally this gradient would correspond for, in particular, by looking at the abundance of proteins that are either characterized to, to be abundant in pro-inflammatory macrophages, M1, or those that are more abundant in anti-inflammatory or M2 macrophages. And we saw this very strong linear correlation indicating that in this case, we see a, a M1, M2 polarization axis in, in our data emerging. Another thing that I want to emphasize for, in, for this example is that we could not have observed this result by sorting the M1, the macrophages, because if we were to sort them, maybe we could see, we could sort them into two discrete clusters, but we would not have known that there is a, a continuum between the polar in the polarization state. So uh, that, that's one of the important uh, caveats to always keep in mind when you're sorting for a predetermined states of cells, that there is an assumption built into that sorting that is very difficult to test if, if you don't perform single cell analysis. Uh, we also compared the RNA and the protein data by doing, uh, we, we obtained single cell RNA sequencing data from the same system by doing correlation vector analysis. And we found, not surprisingly, that uh, uh, over a thousand genes show similar, at least qualitatively similar uh, behavior at the RNA and the protein level. But there are also hundreds of genes that differ in, in their behavior between the RNA and the protein level. And these genes tend to be enriched for signaling activity as indicated by this protein site enrichment analysis. We can also do various dimensionality uh, reduction analysis with these data jointly with the RNA and the protein data. In this case, we used CONUS for joint embedding of the data. That's another computational application that has been widely developed and applied for RNA sequencing data sets. And in this case, we extend it to, to the protein data. And one interesting observation here is that the protein, that the cells analyzed by mass spectrometry shown here in blue for the macrophages and uh, magenta for the, for the monocytes form tighter clusters than the cells analyzed by RNA sequencing which is suggesting that there is more variability, perhaps both technical and biological in analyzing messenger RNAs as opposed to, to proteins. Uh, and as one is doing this high throughput analysis, it's also good to keep in mind that there are severe batch effects that might affect the data or maybe not, but that's a good thing to, to test. And in this case, when we plotted the various batches in our low dimensional projection, we were um, uh, happy to see that uh, batch effects did not contribute to, to the separation of cells. And finally, I want to focus on what I think is an exciting frontier for going beyond just descriptive clustering of, of cells, identifying new states and proteomes, which, and, and proteome gradients, which is certainly useful. But to me, what is more exciting is going in the direction of identifying functional regulatory relationships. Again, referring back to uh, the talk yesterday from Rudy Abersold pointing at, at the potential of using uh, mass spectrometry data to, uh, to get closer to function and, and phenotypes. And there is this idea that by looking at the joint distributions of proteins, of protein levels across lots of lots of single cells, we might be able to perform inferences based on fewer assumptions. For example, we don't need to fit parametric models into the data, rather we can condition the joint distributions and we can formalize these ideas of, of simply conditioning joint distributions based on confounders and simply asking whether the, joint, the conditional joint distributions are product of the conditional marginal distributions or not. And based on such approaches, we can directly test whether kinases regulate each other or proteins regulate each other by making fewer assumptions than what is currently the case. So one, one small step in this direction that we made was to combine our single cell RNA and single cell protein data by performing common principle component analysis. So each cell here, each, each marker here corresponds to a single cell in, in which we have measured either the protein level on the uh, y-axis or the RNA level. 
And some of the highly abundant genes that have similar behavior at the RNA and the protein level sh show these highly correlated joint distributions, which are consistent with the protein being mostly regulated uh, transcriptionally and being well measured by both mass spectrometry and RNA sequencing. Now, if you go to less abundant proteins, less abundant messenger RNAs that again show qualitatively similar behavior, you begin to see some of the discreteness of the RNA measurement having counted either zero, one, two, three molecules, and the protein measurement provides a more smooth um, uh, measurement because it's not affected by, by the counting noise as much. And, and in this case also uh, appears to show a, a bimodal distribution of, of this protein. Now, what's more interesting is to look at P53. As, as you remember from the beginning, I mentioned that P53 is primarily regulated at the level of, of protein degradation. And consistent with that, we don't see a strong um, correlation between the abundances of the protein in the corresponding messenger RNA. But then we can go one step further. We can ask, so what is more predictive for P53 function? Is it the protein level that we measured by mass spectrometry or the RNA level that we measured by sequencing? So to get to that question, we simply correlated P53 abundance to the abundance of its target genes. And we find that the correlation between P53 messenger RNAs and the target genes regulated by P53 is closely distributed around zero for both activated and repressed targets, which is consistent with the messenger RNA not being informative for the activity of the protein. And P53 protein is negatively correlated to the repressed targets, which is consistent with our expectation and suggesting that the protein level that we measured is more informative for the activity. We don't see the expected correlation for the activated targets, which can be explained by the fact that these targets are also activated, regulated by many other transcription factors that we did not take into account P53 localization in the nucleus or post-translational modifications. But nonetheless, what, what we see is that the protein level that we have measured so far is already a little bit closer to telling us about the function of, of, of the transcription factor than the RNA level measured by RNA sequencing. And again, I just scratched the surface here by telling you some examples from my lab, how we have used single cell uh, proteomics to begin to look at, at uh, macrophage heterogeneity and some biological regulatory interactions. But I think that there is a tremendous space for creative students like you to, to come up with new ideas and extend the application of single cell proteomics to biology. Because at the end of the day, as I started from the beginning, that's why we developed the methods. Not for the sake of quantifying more proteins in HeLa cells, that's a useful technical benchmark, but for the sake of being able to learn new biology from heterogeneous tissues made of, of, of different cell types. So everything that I talked about today from my group has been a result of a very, very collaborative and, and fun team uh, that has made it uh, a wonderful journey, certainly for me, in developing and, and applying these methods. And particularly, uh, Harrison Specht and Gray Huffman have been um, leading uh, the uh, the research that they presented today. And, and there are many exciting developments in particular by Andrew and, and Alex that they didn't have time to, to mention since I wanted to focus more on uh, examples of uh, how uh, computation can, uh, can increase our ability to interpret single cell mass spectrometry data. Uh, and of course, I would like to acknowledge the generous uh, funding support from the NIH Directors Award and the Paul Allen Frontiers Group, without which uh, the work that they presented would not have been possible. So with that, uh, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very, very much. This was very interesting and I really like your uh... Uh, suggestion to uh, people to think about their own ideas. I think that's what science is all about. So thank you also for that. Um, so I think uh, first Christoph has a question or wants to make some remark. And then I would also like uh, the attendees to give the option to uh, 
take questions, uh, to uh, ask questions. So maybe they can raise their hands. Yeah, so thank you, Nikolai. It was a very interesting overview. Um, so you, you mentioned that your uh, MassPack device is a relatively old technology. Uh, I was wondering what is the opportunities of the recent developments um, in, in the MassPack world to single cell proteomics? It's a wonderful question, Christo. So certainly, uh, one, there, there are instruments with increased sensitivity, most prominently the, the recently re released uh, TeamStop SCP from, from Brooker, uh, with which we are currently experimenting. Uh, so uh, I think that there is the potential to increase the sensitivity, not so much of the detectors, because detectors are already very sensitive. I think uh, there are very big opportunities in improving peptide separation and, uh, and ionization delivery of the ions inside of the instrument. And in fact, that's uh, some of the uh, important technological contributions in the TeamStop SCP. Uh, Orbitraps are wonderful instruments. Uh, the newer instruments uh, are, not, are not benefiting as much. They're, they're good. They're, they're certainly better than the... Um, Q-Exactive Classic that we're using in many ways, but those ways are not directly benefiting single cell protein analysis as much because one of our biggest limitations is not the speed of the orbitrap, but the time needed to accumulate ions. So even though newer orbitraps can, uh, can uh, do the scans at high resolution faster, they're still limited by the need to accumulate ions longer. That being said, there are important contributions of ion mobility via FAMES that reduces background plus one ions and has been very helpful, especially for label-free single cell analysis. There are also brighter ion sources that are beneficial. The increased resolution of the newer instruments uh, increases the signal to noise ratio, even if there are relatively few copies being measured. So all of these improvements are, are beneficial and uh, I think they're, they're helpful. But I, I focus more on the experimental designs because I feel that this is something that my group and I think many of, of, of the attendees in the audience can contribute more directly to because the credit for developing the, the new instruments mostly belongs to the developer, to, to the companies, to, to the people who build the instrumentation. And those are always on beneficial and on the top of whatever methods we, we develop. For example, the isobaric carrier increases our ability to determine sequences for any instrument that we use. We develop that in, on QE basic, but if you apply this on any other instrument, whether that's a team stuff or an Eclipse or an Explorers, the benefit is still there. So I think the, the, the instrument development, the instrument, the advancement in instruments are very synergistic with these other aspects that they mostly focused on. Thank you. So now I want to give Otavia uh, the option to give uh, a question. So I hope he'll... Yes, perfect. So thank you very much for your nice presentation. I have a question. So I'm working with a species which is not uh, very well known and uh, they uh, cannot use, for example, antibodies to sort uh, the single cells. Which other technique would you recommend to get single cells uh, to do analysis afterwards? So I've seen a combination of flow cytometry and pseudo hybridization, for example, but maybe you have also other suggestions. Thank you. Well, if you, if you don't have good antibodies, then you can always sort based on, on other parameters. Actually, one thing that comes to mind here is fax gate. This is a very interesting approach that was published um, couple of years ago in cell, where you can uh, record on the fax sorter various features of the cells, not label with antibodies, but rather look at side scatter, forward scatter. You can also use some other dyes. And then you can perform RNA sequencing of the sorted cells, identify which are the cell types of interest. And then based on these, you can choose fax gates to sort cell types of interest. So that's, that's one approach that you should be able to use, even if if you don't have good antibodies. And uh, one thing that they would add is even for uh, well-studied species such as human, mouse, and so on, finding good antibodies that are specific is, is always a challenge. 
So I think Pavel wanted to ask a question now. If I may, I would like to ask two questions. Um, it's That's a nice fine. presentation and very clear presentation as usual. That's, thank you very much. That's really, really, really nice. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think about NGS rivals? Like this uh, RNA, RNA peptide aptamers, illumina-based uh, antibodies, Oxford nanopores. What do you think, uh, how is this kind of progress on that side? In terms of course, protein sequencing. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's a very exciting field that has received a lot of attention lately. And I haven't seen much data to support the feasibility of analyzing complex protein mixtures with these approaches. As far as I know, these other affinity reagents are not any more specific than antibodies. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of experience with antibodies um, uh, that indicate how difficult it is to maintain uh, highly specific antibodies. Another aspect is the difficulty of verifying the specificity in different contexts because an antibody that is highly, highly specific for one set of samples may be utterly non-specific for another set of samples because that other set of samples has another protein that also binds the antibody not present in the first set. So I think testing the specificity of, of large array of affinity reagents and verifying it for each set of samples is going to be a major challenge for, for that set of approaches. I think some of the single peptide sequencing approaches seem more uh, exciting to me and more promising in particular, I quite like the work of Ed, Emo, of, of, um, Ed Marcos lab of the single molecule Edmund sequencing. And these approaches are very much challenged by the huge dynamic range of the proteome, uh, because even if they work very well, given that um, so many of the proteins in the cell are going to be histone proteins, tubulin and actin and so on, uh, one would have to sequence billions of, of proteins before one can obtain deep coverage at a single cell. And that's going to be a formidable challenge for, for these methods. But I think altogether, the, the excitement in that space is, is good. And I think that these methods are likely to become complementary to, to mass spectrometry in some ways, perhaps analyzing very lowly abundant but simpler mixtures where specificity is not as, as challenging as analyzing the cell lysate of, of a human cell of very complex protein mixtures. So we think it's yet to see what's going to come out of these approaches. It's, it's very early days. Thank you. Okay, and one more question. Uh, what, what, can you comment on feasibility of making pool chase uh, with TMT uh, on a single cell level? Because of course it's, it will be awesome uh, for completing the uh, like equation in in a, in a sense that we can really see how expression goes. Is it possible? Have you tried pool chase? Yeah, we have. We have. It actually mm -hmm. that's part of what what we work on with our funding from the Allen Frontiers Group. Uh, we are very interested in that, and they think that there is a possibility of using it both to measure protein synthesis and, and degradation. That's one application, but the other one is to encode multiple time points in the proteome of a single cell so that when we do our destructive measurement at the end of the experiment, we not only measure the state of the cell at that point, but we have information about its past trajectory, which would be a little bit along the lines of, let's say, RNA velocity approaches, except that one can have multiple time points and one can have those time points at any time resolution that is desired suited to the system rather than a time resolution that is defined by the splicing rate in the cell. That's very exciting. Thank you very much. So we have some more questions from the audience. Uh, maybe Wagner, Wagner, you go first. Uh, well, first, thank you for the inspiring presentation. And my question is, uh, is it feasible to do with the instruments available today a combination to perform top-down proteomics at the single cell level? I think it, it's, it's certainly feasible. The question is how deep you can go and how you can do it. I'm certainly not one to be afraid of a challenge. I think that would be wonderful. And in fact, I've received that question a number of times, usually from students, which I think is good, shows how fearless students are. And I'm confident that that's going to happen. It is clearly more challenging than doing the bottom-up approach 
but I absolutely think that this can be done. Uh, and the question is exactly which approach is going to give you the, the highest sensitivity, what's going to be the biological application, how many proteins you can identify. I certainly don't expect to begin with that a top-down approach will allow us to analyze as many proteins as a bottom-up approach, but it might allow us to identify proteoforms, and that's important, or even protein complexes, and that's even more exciting. But uh, one, one thing that I would add on, on this topic is that uh, we have thought a lot about the proteome inference problem, even from bottom-up data, and Rudy spoke a bit about that yesterday. We have developed an, an approach, Max Quant Live, uh, uh, sorry, High Quant, High Quant published a couple of years ago in MCP, where we are able to infer proteoforms from bottom-up data using only relative quantification. So the approach makes no assumptions in the inference, as long as the relative quantification is accurate, we can infer the ratios between different proteoforms and their existence or non-existence. So um, I think that, yeah, there's, there's basically a computational approach that can allow you to make use from bottom-up data to infer proteoforms. And that is not going to solve all of the challenges for which we need top-down methods. There's still the need for top-down. And I think that we need fearless people with good ideas to start working on that front and, and to make it to make it a reality. I, I certainly think it's possible. Challenging, but very possible. Thank you both for the question and the answer. Uh, uh, Pin Rui, maybe you go. Uh, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I was just con concerning about uh, regarding to the RNA sequencing, uh, single cell RNA sequencing. We usually can get into a very high throughput, uh, but regarding the single cell uh, proteomics, it's a bit um, extensive, let's say, to reach a high throughput. For example, you if you want to get a thousand cells and you only have PMT 10 or 11, then you need to run hundreds of runs, right? So what would you comment on the throughput, how many would it be enough and um, how can it be more feasible to reach that high throughput? So currently the throughput of single cell mass spectrometry is lower than the throughput of RNA sequencing. Now with RNA sequencing, there are two large branches of methods. One is the multi-well based methods and the other is the droplet methods. And the multi-well plate methods were developed for us, they usually allow you to get data from a few thousand single cells. That's how they're used. And they have higher capture efficiency compared to droplet methods that can give you very large number of cells analyzed, but usually with lower capture efficiency, fewer transcripts, more noise in the data. Uh, so for the multi-well uh, based methods, you get a few thousand cells analyzed. And this is entirely feasible to do with um, scope two, for example, because you can analyze about 200 cells per day or about a thousand per week. And then if you spend a couple of weeks of data acquisition time of operating in continuous mode, which is something that now we can increasingly do in, in my lab, uh, then you can obtain thousands of, of single cells, which should be enough for very many biological applications. So I'm sure that throughput will continue to increase. It's not as easy for us to increase multiplexing for uh, proteomics as it is to increase multiplexing for RNA sequencing. It's just harder to do. But I do see multiplexing as being a very big part of the solution because uh, it also reduces the cost per single cell. And that's very important. Most of our cost is dominated by instrument time, not anything else. And I think that there are uh, lots of lots of interesting questions that one can approach with thousands of single cells analyzed at the proteome level. The other aspect is it's okay if proteomics never have the throughput of RNA sequencing because RNA sequencing is commonly used for clustering. You want to identify cell types and proteomics can complement it. Once you identify your cell types, you can focus more on functional studies. I'm very excited about extending single cell mass spectrometry to measuring not just protein abundances, but for example, protein shapes. There, there was a beautiful paper recently from the group of John Yates showing how dimethyl labeling can infer 
uh, uh, protein shapes in living cells. And I think that this approach, in fact, they wrote the perspective on that uh, news and views can be extended to single cells where we don't just aim to analyze more cells, but we want to understand how a protein conformation is changing, how a protein interaction is changing. So from that perspective, I see the mass spectrometry approach as being very much complementary to next generation sequencing, not competing. Uh, so you can always use the shallower coverage, higher cell number throughput for clustering purposes, identifying cell types, and use mass spectrometry for cases where you really want to look at regulatory mechanisms or protein interactions, protein modifications, post-translational modifications, and so on. Um, and for the most part, I think even the current throughput is, is already at the point that is um, suitable for lots of biological experiments. Okay, so I think we will take two more questions. So first, Klau, please. Uh, hi. Uh, on, on the topic of kinase kinase regulation, uh, first I was thinking how many cells you need to measure to create a reliable joint distribution. And secondly, uh, I mean, within this field, I've seen that it's very important to consider doing perturbations in order to infer the regulatory uh, relationship, such as using kinase inhibitors and then study what happens when you have the inhibitor versus when you don't have it. So from the analysis that you present, uh, do you think that you also need these uh, other experimental designs to uh, validate so the findings? So let me just say to begin with, just one clarification that the Chinese inference example that they gave was within the aspirational run. We haven't yet done it. We, we have done, we have measured phosphorylation. We have some preliminary data on that. They would be forthcoming publication, but how many cells? Well, that depends somewhat on the complexity of the network uh, that you're trying to infer and the confounding factors, how much condition one would have to do. For that, I would think that tens of thousands of single cells should already allow you to uh, to to control for lots of nuisances and interferences, and should be better of doing the analysis this way with single cell proteomics rather than any other way. The perturbations are not, and 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 the single cell analysis are not mutually exclusive. But if you do your standard perturbation approach and you do a bulk measurement you still have a major problem because your perturbation is going to, is likely to affect uh, lots of phosphorylation sites in several kinases. And then it's very hard to disentangle what are the direct and what are the indirect effects. I think that this is one of the really, really hard things in biology. It's easy to measure causality with perturbations. You change the media of the cells, you put an inhibitor, and now you measure thousands of proteins or phosphopeptides changing in abundance. That's causal, no question about it. It's also close to useless if you, if you don't know what is the path of information transfer. If you just see all of these things changing in the same way, it is really, really hard to disentangle how the information was transferred between the molecules. And I think that's where single cell measurements come, where you can think of, you can actually think of each single cell having a unique proteome state corresponding to its own unique perturbation. And then you can, basically condition, if you want to know if a particular molecule is directly interacting or not with another one, you can condition on the confounding molecules, which means you pick cells in which the confounder is not changing in abundance. And if it's not changing, therefore it cannot be doing the information transfer and see if you still have a residual correlation or not. What is the joint distribution now? So in short, this approach is not, um, uh, incompatible with perturbations. It can be used with perturbations, but it's more powerful because you can apply it to cells taken from directly from a human patient where you may not be able to do a perturbation. In some cases, you may want to do a perturbation, but even if you do a perturbation, to go beyond saying that they have thousand fossil peptides changing causally in response to that, uh, to that perturbation, you want to say, oh, I have kinase A interacting with kinase B, which then interacts with those other things to get a more detailed path of information transfer. Uh, 
I think is what the single cell analysis can, can really empower. And to do that without assuming some silly model uh, in period, uh, that you have to fit to your data, but do it in a data-driven way, just looking at what are my joint distributions, what is consistent with either direct or indirect regulatory path. Great, thank you. So for the sake of time, we'll take one more question. We'll come from Saket. Thank you for the opportunity for me to ask the question. Uh, it was a very nice talk. Uh, uh, what is the minimum number of single cell proteomics data we need to interpret and appropriate biological inference for our experiment? Well, it's very much dependent on the experiment. We have a really exciting collaboration now looking at early development in an early development system where we can make interesting observations and inferences from dozens of single cells. There are other cases, if you look at the tissue that is composed of lots of different cell types, for example, we have a CZI funded project looking at the cell composition of human testes. And for that, to, to be able to characterize meaningfully cells present at less than 10% of the population, we need to have thousands of single cells. So I think the number varies from only a few cells in some cases, and, and those cases tend to be the exception, to, to hundreds and thousands. I, I think that most of the questions that they can think of can substantially benefit by analyzing a few hundred to a few thousand cells. I wouldn't worry and I wouldn't be um, hesitant to start using the methods at the moment because I can analyze 5,000 cells and not 500,000. I think that even if you get a few thousand cells, you're in a good shape to start doing interesting biology. And that is only a couple of weeks of instrument time. It, uh, it's, it's very short relative to the duration of most projects. So I think data acquisition is currently not the necessarily the limitation. I think what we need are robust protocols that can be widely adopted beyond the labs of developers and pioneers in the field, but something that can work in the standard good facility because there's certainly demand. If I've seen tremendous amount of requests and for single cell proteomics to have a large impact we need to have it practiced across hundreds and hundreds of labs and lots of facilities. And I think we are at a stage when we are ready to start doing that and generating data that uh, for thousands of single cells, which I think is adequate for, for the vast majority of biological projects. So I'm super excited to see that happening and uh, being an optimist, I think it's just ahead of us. I think we are at the inflection point where the early development efforts are just going to transition into being widely adopted by many facilities, while of course there will continue to be a vanguard of new method development to, to get to those 60,000 features that we can detect in a single cell. How many of those can we identify? Uh, how can we go beyond just measuring protein abundance to measuring protein conformations, protein interactions, post-translational post modifications, I think all of that is going to be for, for those brave pioneers in the audience, I hope, who are going to take up the challenge and help make it happen. While at the same time, I think that there are established mature protocols that are ready to be widely deployed by, by many, including by good facilities. Thank you very, very much again, Professor Slavov. It was an honor to have you here.